Hello and welcome back to the IEA YouTube channel. I'm Emily Carver. So 2021 was yet another tumultuous year dominated by our response to the pandemic. This time last year, we were plunged into another national lockdown and things were looking pretty bleak. So at least on that front, things are looking a little brighter as we head into 2022. Most people are now double or triple jabbed. The dominant variant of the virus is now known to be far milder than those that came before it. And while pressure on the NHS is severe, we are a long way from where we were last January. One of the new threats facing the government and something our economists have long been warning about is the rise to the cost of living. We're seeing energy prices spiral, inflation has surged considerably and tax rises are on the horizon. Then, of course, we've got longer term trends to worry about. We've seen massive state interference in the economy and the prioritisation of safety over freedom. Will the government continue on with their interventionist approach in the economy and our lives? And how optimistic should we be for economic growth in 2022? To discuss this, I'm joined by Christopher Snowden, Head of Lifestyle Economics at the IEA and Economics Fellow Julian Jessup. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and do leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. So, Chris, let's uh, have a look at our response to COVID. You've probably been following the data and the government's response the most carefully, probably at the IEA. How do you think the government's response to the virus is likely to change over the course of the next year? Do you reckon we can probably say we're safely out of uh, the days of lockdown? They're well and truly over, at least in England. What do you think is going to happen? Yes, I think that's very, very likely. I mean, I think there might be a tail risk of something catastrophic happening. But quite honestly, I don't I don't see how lockdowns are ever a realistic solution let alone anything else i mean if you look at the netherlands for example which is one of the few countries in europe to have gone into a really quite strict lockdown um began i think on the 18th of december they they did see cases go down but now they've, seen, they've just recorded a record high um i think that omicron is just so transmissible that it can't really be stopped so there's, there's a lot of doubt over whether delta even could really be stopped uh, through lockdowns new zealand and australia kind of tested that and had to give up omicron even more so, it's quite possible we'll have another variant which is even more transmissible than that. So lockdowns aren't even a, a viable solution, really. I mean, they could maybe take the edge off it. And some countries, I'm sure, over the course of the next few weeks are going to start adopting them in Europe. I think we're better placed than those countries, partly because we opened up uh, in July and we developed more immunity and also because we have we had a much more successful booster program. Um, the only real cloud on the horizon is, is the possibility of the boosters waning. Um, they do seem to wane somewhat after about 10 to 12 weeks, although not so much for severe disease and hospitalisation. So I think even that hopefully shouldn't be a, a major problem. But the government has stuck to its guns. It's had a plan since this time last year. You know, it had a roadmap. It came out of it very slowly, but once it came out of it, it was supposed to be irreversible. There was a bit of a bump in the road with the Plan B stuff, the vaccine passports and the, and the face masks. Face masks have come back in, in in schools. I don't think any of that is really um, necessary or worthwhile, but it's actually pretty minor stuff, really, compared to what of Europe is doing and a lot of what we've done in the past. So I would think that um, it's going to be a very tough uh, few weeks, uh, absolutely, as you've already alluded to, for the NHS. But I don't think we're going to get to a stage where we're going to need to bring in any major restrictions. And I think after that period um, has passed you know, in, in January, basically going into, into February and March, I think we can look forward to the future with a great deal of optimism. But of course, nothing's ever certain. Um, the, the emergence of Delta and Omicron last year were major setbacks. Um, and I'm very pleased that we've, we've overcome them, I think, as well as we could have done. What's your view on the whole COVID jab situation? Do you think there is some kind of sustainable long-term solution? Do you think we will all be having this booster jab every few weeks, every few months? Um, or do you think the government will change its mind on that and just focus on the vulnerable, target those? Do you have any opinion on what the government should be doing? Do you think the current sort of, you know, Israel are doing a fourth jab now? Do you think we'll continue on in that same uh, way? boosting all the time? I think that's largely a scientific question. I don't, we don't have the answers to it yet. Um, 
I, I don't have a problem with people getting an annual jab. We do it for flu. Nobody's ever really complained about old people having a, a jab for flu. Not even old people, middle-aged people getting a jab for flu. It's never been a big, like, civil liberties issue. And now people go, oh, my God, we're giving, giving all these jabs. Well, you know, as long as they're not compulsory, um, as long as you don't, you know, you don't have to get them to get your vaccine passport. Well, I think that will kind of fizzle out over the course of the year as well. Then um, I think it makes sense for people over, the, over a certain age to be getting at least an annual booster if they... Feel they need them in the meantime if they really do weigh that much then um, maybe more regularly than that uh, but as I say I think it's a scientific question it depends on how much immunity do you get from having had Omicron you know once everybody's had um, Covid or, or Omicron whatever it may be and most people have had I think now um, some form of, of Covid-19 and we know that you know prior immunity sorry prior infection does give you quite a bit of um, resilience and quite a you know there's stronger immunity possibly than the than the jabs um, so once, yeah, I think the name of the game has been to vaccinate people so you take the edge of it so they don't end up going to hospital and dying, um, but they can then get natural immunity. They can, they can get infected without too much problem. And hopefully that combination of having had two or three jabs plus existing immunity from prior infection should be enough for us not to be worrying about this disease in the way that we certainly have been doing over the last two years and hopefully not more than any other disease such as flu. I just worry that sort of uh, younger people may have to have, you know, a third, a fourth, a fifth jab in order to have their vaccine passport or to have their vaccine status up to date. Um, that's my only concern on that. Oh, that's absolutely that is something we should be fighting against. There's no yeah. reason for that to be happening. You know, I don't think anybody under the age of 40 really should in any way be compelled to have um, to have the vaccines. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the vaccines. I think they work very well. And I'm very mm -hmm. proud of the, 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 the booster campaign. But, you know, let's be honest, they are not great at stopping people getting COVID-19. It's just, it's just a fact. Um, there's no doubt whatsoever that people who have been unvaccinated have been, you know, clogging up the hospitals, as it were, more than everybody else. There's no doubt that they've been dying in higher numbers. Um, but in terms of, you know, this, you don't get sterilising immunity um, to COVID with the existing vaccines. And maybe that's another thing to be optimistic about in 2022, is we might get some, some better vaccines. We've certainly got better treatments. Um, but no, for the time being, absolutely no reason to be using any form of coercion, uh, really against anybody, but particularly against people who are young and extremely unlikely to get seriously ill from COVID, never have been. Julian, you've been um, talking about on, in the media and, uh, and uh, um, written as well about the isolation mm -hmm. rules, um, talking about how perhaps they should be reconsidered, perhaps they should be shortened, like in the US where they're down to five days um when you test positive what do you think the economic impact of these rules yeah. has been thus far and do you think these things will sort of do you think the government will move away from these isolation rules altogether simply because of all the problems that there are and because we know that the omicron is uh, milder thank goodness um what do you sort of see in that respect in terms of those rules i, I think that's right the more that we learn about omicron the the weaker the case for for lengthy isolation periods um for a start as as chris was saying we we now know that omicron is a is a milder illness in terms of the the risks to to life um we also seem to be learning that the infectiousness of, of omicron tends to to fade after just a few days so the additional benefit of isolating for longer than that is, is quite small um, in terms of the costs of isolation measures, I mean, those are proving to be pretty big. I mean, partly this is ironically because Omicron is so easily transmissible. Many more people are having to isolate than we first anticipated. And that's having a, a big impact um, on the economy. Uh, clearly, if you've got 10% plus staff shortages, it's very hard to, to maintain the same level of output as you were before. But on top of that sort of economic hit, you've also got a hit to, to vital services, including the very ones we're trying to protect, namely the NHS. And there's growing evidence that the big problem for the NHS is, is not a surge of seriously unwell people with COVID. Uh, if you look at things like the number of people on mechanical ventilators, it's actually not much different now from where it was at the end of November. Instead, the problem is a lack of staff to deal with any sort of patient, uh, whatever their condition is. And, you know, frankly, if, if, if I've broken my leg and go into hospital, I don't care about the COVID status of the person treating me. I just want them to save my leg. So I think there's a danger that in focusing so much on the risk from Omicron, we miss those sort of broader economic impacts, but also the impact on the health service itself. So 
Um, I think the case for continuing to ease those isolation rules over time is, is very strong. Uh, you mentioned the example of the US that's already gone down to, to five days. Um, arguably, South Africa, you know, the, the epicenter of the outbreak in the first place, um, has pretty much gone the whole hog. It's, it's abandoned uh, asymptomatic testing and contract tracing simply because so many people have got uh, the Omicron variant. It's not worth it anymore. It's a sign, I think I'm going to chip in, it's a sign, I think, of how much milder Omicron is and uh, how much we're in a better place than we were this time last year. The The main problem now is is staff shortages rather than the disease itself. You know, when you hear somebody say that they've got Omicron, your first thought isn't to think, oh my God, I hope you're going to be all right, I'm going to go to the hospital. You think, oh, that's annoying. You know, you've got to self-isolate. And people are not declaring their, um, you know, they're not getting PCR tests a lot of the time because they don't want to self-isolate. You've got Fauci over in America cutting the... The isolation time down we've got it cut down here um you know a year ago we had boris johnson go on tv to say look this is more or less our darkest hour we're going to go into lockdown for months because you know the the, the health service has never been under more pressure this time he went on tv he didn't change any rules and just said look there might be some staff shortages coming up you know it's a it's a much happier place to be in really and i agree with julian that you know probably we can get rid of this stuff now i think um i think once we've accepted that you know how many people have got it at the moment? Like three and a half million people in England have, uh, have currently testing positive for, for for Omicron, primarily or COVID-19. Um, th- there isn't a lot of point. It seems to me it does more damage to the health service to, to have these people self isolating than it would do to, to have them working. And the same, of course, applies to this ridiculous decision to sack 90,000 NHS workers because they haven't got jabbed. Go, going back to what I said before, the jabs don't provide sufficient immunity from infection to in any way justify that and the costs of sacking 90,000 people from a health service which is already severely understaffed are clearly they clearly outweigh any conceivable benefits you're going to get from um from trying to coerce these people who by the looks of it are not going to be persuaded by anything into getting jabbed so how the, you- actually sorry another example there is the uh, the travel restrictions, which are already being eased. And again, that, that makes sense because given that Omicron is, you know, running rampant through the rest of Europe and much of the rest of the world, it, it's no longer much point in trying to prevent people from, from traveling here. But but one thing that does worry me is that some of the recent opinion polling has suggested that people actually wanted to keep those restrictions, even though um, you know, the cost-benefit analysis was, was pretty much against them. It, it does worry me that we have sort of moved into a mentality where, Lots of people actually seem to like lockdown restrictions. They, they feel that something needs to be done and they, they feel safer. And that politicians you know, might respond to that pressure, even if the, if the case for tightening restrictions or keeping restrictions is, is still pretty flimsy. Um, that fortunately doesn't seem to be the case so much in, you know, with the Boris government in, in England, but you know, it's a tendency in Scotland, for example, to, to try and be tougher, Wales and Northern Ireland to a lesser degree. So, I mean, hopefully it is generally going to be driven by the, the science, including the the science of economics not by you know whatever latest opinion poll might be yeah well hopefully hopefully this coming year people will begin to uh, change their mentality when it comes to that and begin to uh you know t- get away from that that mentality of uh, wanting safety above or else perhaps it could be the year we start living with the virus we'll see um looking to something a little more miserable um the cost of living um, this is going to be a massive thorn in the side of the government. I mean, for many people, their quality of life, it does look like it's going to take a massive hit, at least in the next few months. Do you think the threat of inflation, um, Julian, is mm-hmm. here to stay? Is raising interest rates going to be enough um, to stop that from surging further? What do you reckon? Well, I, actually, having been relatively pessimistic about inflation throughout last year, I'm actually finding myself on the relatively optimistic side. Um, I think lots of commentators last year underestimated the the inflation risk. Um, But as we know, if there's enormous amounts of cheap money chasing too few goods and services, then um, inflation was always likely to to be a problem. Um, But I think most of that inflation surge is now behind us. If you step back a bit, um, headline inflation was just over 5% in November. Is likely to rise to, to 6% over the next few months, uh, partly depending on what happens to the energy price cap in, in April. But but that does mean that inflation is already pretty close to, to where it's going to peak. Uh, and I think it will you know, fall back over the remainder of the year as some of sort of you know, one-off effects like the rebound in energy prices drop out of the annual comparison. But also as central banks um, 
take some of the foot off the accelerator. And it's partly a question of higher interest rates, but I think actually it's mainly about stopping printing so much money. And lots of central banks are starting to, to taper their asset purchases or have, have ended them altogether. So I think there are good reasons to expect inflation to, to fall back over the remainder of the year. Um, that said, I, I don't think we can be complacent about this. We know that higher inflation has you know, disproportionate impact on poorer people, particularly energy prices, because low-income households spend a bigger proportion of their, their money on, on energy than, than richer households do. So um, it's probably going to be necessary for the government to provide a bit more support for them. Um, but it can do that through the benefit system. I don't think there's a great case for the government intervening to, uh, to cap prices, to interfere in the market, to prevent you know, prices rising to balance supply and demand. Um, the other big shock on the horizon, though, is, is tax increases. So in April, the same month that the energy price cap is likely to go up, there's various tax increases coming into effect, in particular the, the one and quarter percent increase in national insurance contributions. And um, I think there is a decent case, actually, for delaying those tax increases for a year. Um, the, the point about those tax increases was that in the short term, they're going to be funding the NHS and in particular getting on top of the backlog of cases due to the pandemic. Um, but I think that's a sort of a one-off cost that you could reasonably add to long-term borrowing. You don't need to finance that from current taxation. So I think you could put those uh, tax increases on hold and instead allow strong economic growth to repair the public finances. And that might mean a little bit more borrowing in the short term, but I think you end up with a stronger economy and better public finances in the longer term too. Chris, I mean, what do you think in terms of inflation do you agree with julian there um but also why why do you think it seemed to come as such a surprise to so many commentators and economists that we were going to have this surge in inflation was it just that it didn't fit their particular narrative or their own ideology it's it was weird wasn't it the the economist put out an article or a tweet saying uh, the the rise in inflation has blindsided economists almost no one saw it coming i mean i i was predicting like i did <laughs> four or five percent inflation by the end of 2021 a year ago you know and that seemed like an outlandish thing to a lot of people for some reason i, I guess it was partly because people just aren't used to it we've gone so long with a relatively low inflation economy and I actually have to look at it over the last 12 years. There's been two fairly significant spikes in inflation even before now. But generally speaking, it's been lower than um, than you might expect. And the, all the concept of easing after the financial crisis didn't lead to an obvious surge in inflation, certainly not as much as a lot of economists perhaps would have predicted. So there was an element of being kind of twice shy about it. But, you know, it should have been fairly obvious because it wasn't just the, the enormous amount of, of money printing. Um, it was... Also, I mean, loads of things, even the, even the Suez Canal being blocked, the energy price spike, all this stuff, perfect ingredients for a bout of inflation. I tend to agree with Jude. I'm not quite as optimistic as him. I, I tend to agree with him that it's certainly plausible that we will be getting near the peak of it and it will start to come down um, because a lot of the the drivers of inflation last year were sort of kind of one-off things up to a point. On the other hand, I think that, you know, some kind of, inflation wage, well, wage price spiral is absolutely not out of the question. Um, I mean, it would be perfectly reasonable for employees to be asking for a pay rise of at least 5% um, next time you know, they're in negotiations. Trade unions would be perfectly entitled to ask that for their members as well. I think the government will have to do it for NHS staff, for example, just for basic for political reasons. But it's also kind of the right thing to do if you allow inflation to, to rise as it has then um, you have to pay people more money. And then when you pay people more money, how do the businesses pay for the higher wages? They've got to put the prices up and then people have to pay, you know, the inflation goes in, hence the, the classic 1970s spiral. So I don't think that is out of the question at all. But I think the important thing is, whichever of those two things happen, whether you, we do see a, a big rise in wages to catch up with inflation, or if wages are somehow suppressed, um, either way, you've got a cost of living crisis on your hands. Mm -hmm. There's nothing good about suppressing wages when prices have gone up five, six, seven percent. Um, you, 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 but there's also nothing good about allowing inflation to spiral out of control. So there is no you know, good scenario here. We, we're looking at people effectively having less money in their pocket, whatever happens. Also, Julia mentioned there that um, the government's going to have to spend more on the benefit system because of the uh, energy prices and the impact that's going to have on bills and is already happening on bills. People have been speaking about VAT needing to be cut, perhaps some of the green levies being cut. 
okay, that might be you reduce bills slightly for the average household. Do you expect the government to do make any longer term changes, any more radical changes to the way that we run energy? It might start you know, giving people money to buy fossil fuels, you know, which is you know, effectively what's been done. If you look at actually what happened last year in the build up to COP26, this wonderful moment in which we were going to achieve uh, net zero over the course of 30 years. Well, the government actually at one point bailed out the carbon dioxide industry, literally. They made sure that everybody, or tried to make sure that everybody had petrol when there was a, a run on petrol. And now it's looking at, um, well, I mean, Labour wants to cut VAT on, on, on fuel completely. I mean, th these are problems, not entirely, but largely created by the government. Andy May has uh, given a few interviews about this, saying that you know, high energy prices are a feature, not a bug, of the government's energy policy. They want to put up the price of fossil fuels and and replace them with what are for the time being at least more expensive forms of energy so this is kind of inevitable and i think that the whole drive towards net zero is another problem for the economy not just next year this year but for the next 20 or 30 years it, it, it's an unbelievably expensive project mm -hmm. um a lot of it is, is pie in the sky and the government is going to spend an unbelievable amount of money um tr trying to achieve it um how successful they'll be, I don't know. I don't think they'll, they'll actually literally achieve net zero by 2050 or halve emissions by 2030, but it will spend a huge amount of money trying to get there. And it, we've borrowed money. And that's the thing. You can talk about cutting taxes. Yeah, of course, you know, we, we the IA, we want to see lower taxes, but we also want to see lower spending. Um, the government might want to see lower taxes, although it's shown very little evidence so far. But it certainly doesn't want to see lower spending. So what do we get? We get more borrowing. Where are they going to borrow most of the money? The Bank of England. How's the Bank of England going to get it? It's going to print it. So we're back to inflation again. Yeah, I think there's certainly be, certainly going to be more of the same when it comes to the net zero agenda. I can't believe that the government will backtrack in any way on some of their policies there. OK, Julian, in terms of economic growth. So let's mm -hmm. say, um, assuming no major tightening of restrictions, no awful new variant that's going to kill us all. How optimistic are you about economic growth? Should we have confidence in the economy? Yeah, I think we I think we should. Um, I mean, first of all, looking back at 2021, it's actually a, a much better year than many people anticipated. Um, the UK was the, the fastest growing major economy. Now, some people are quite sniffy when I say that, because, of course, the UK was also the weakest economy in 2020. So it was due some sort of recovery. But um, even allowing for that, the UK economy did a lot better than than many people expected. Um, and in particular, the, the labour market you know, remained strong. So you know, unemployment seemed to have shrugged off completely the end of the furlough scheme, which sort of suggests that the furlough scheme was in place for, for too long and distorting the market. Um, so you've got, you know, pretty strong economic foundations, a, a strong labour market going into into this year. Um, you've got, you know, the various headwinds from from Brexit, and I think there's no doubt that the initial impact of Brexit on the economy uh, last year has has been negative, as you'd expect. If if the main thing that you do is is raise barriers to trade with your biggest single trading partner, there's bound to be some sort of hit on the economy. Um, but a lot of the uncertainty around Brexit is is lifting. Um, and we're starting to see some of the benefits come through. So the opportunity to, to lower trade barriers to the rest of the world and uh, have smarter regulation at home. I, I wish the government would be would be bolder there, but I think the you know the dark days of Brexit are largely now now behind us. So um, I think this year will be another year when the UK economy uh, tops the the growth league amongst the the major economies. Um, I think the response to COVID has been an important part of that. Um, I think the government made lots of mistakes in the early stages of the pandemic, but you know, plan A slash B, wherever we are now, seems to have been the, the right approach. And um, there are already signs that you know, the UK economy did better than the rest of Europe towards the end of last year. It's going into this year with a bit more positive momentum, despite the concerns about COVID. So um, I think this will be a you know, relatively good year for the economy. Uh, and that's important in all sorts of ways. I think it'll help to repair the public finances without the need for, for further tax increases. Maybe they can even you know, revisit some of the ones they've already announced. Um, I think also it'll you know make it easier for the Bank of England to to get interest rates back towards more normal levels and uh, start to unwind the quantitative easing. So I think that'll help to deal with the the inflation problem. So I'm you know I, I'm reasonably positive about the outlook for for this year. Um, the consensus at the beginning of last year was was very negative. It was wrong. The consensus beginning this year is, is very negative. I think it'll probably be wrong again for the same reasons. Hopefully. Uh, Chris, there's been lots of miserable articles written about how awful the first year of Brexit 
has been, well, since we uh, signed our comprehensive trade deal with the EU anyway. Um, do you think there's uh, brighter horizons in that respect, like Julian says? Do you think it's actually gone better than expected or better than some people had said it would do and that there's uh, more to look forward to this year? No, not really. I'm on this, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with you. I'm, I'm much more pessimistic. Um, the economy is in a state, and let's be honest, the economy has been in a state for the best part of 15 years. You know, you don't have interest rates at virtually zero for 14 years and, and have a healthy economy. It's something very seriously wrong with it for various reasons that the IA pointed out in the past, and that no one's making any attempt to, to tackle them. We're basically we're a, a low productivity, high tax economy and it's no wonder we, we can't generate any decent amount of growth the growth we had last year i think was largely a dead cat bounce or whatever you want to call it i mean we we did fall so low that it was pretty easy to get back up but we're still nowhere near where we were before the pandemic began before the first lockdown and and that was nearly two years ago now um so i don't think there's really any reason for optimism. i don't think brexit's going to make any positive difference it could do of course there's lots of things government could do but it's showing no sign of any form of deregulation if you look what it's doing with farming I mean, it's just pathetic you know just paying farmers to to dig ponds and, and build badger sets and all this kind of stuff rather than growing food or um or rearing animals so no i mean i'm afraid that the the government doesn't seem to have a great deal of interest but apart from perhaps liz trust the government doesn't seem to have a great deal of interest in seizing the benefits of brexit perhaps because it doesn't even understand what the what the benefits are other than kind of controlling immigration um so no I, I i think any growth we have this year would be largely illusory you know get back to me when we get back to where we were before the lockdown on a gdp per capita basis if that's even possible by the way because one thing the pandemic has shown is we don't really know how many people actually live in, in the country but nonetheless um we need to know you know where, we, where we, in terms of gdp per capita when we just get back to where we were that's taken long enough but i don't see any kind of um real boost and, and the kind of GDP figures that we've had recently or sort of now and again at least um, have looked more encouraging than they, they really are because of where, how low we were but I think in November GDP grew by 0.1% and according to the ONS that was largely thanks to GP appointments I don't even quite understand how that works but it doesn't seem to me that this is the basis of a thriving economy. Well hopefully you're wrong and we'll be uh, booming this year we'll see um, the picture is uh, certainly Certainly mixed. Um, in terms of that immigration question, I guess it's sort of linked to the next um, to the next uh, uh, issue I'd like to talk about. Um, the labour market, and Julian, you touched on this as well. We've got over a million vacancies in our labour market, unemployment at 4%. Do we have enough people to fill these uh, vacancies? And um, how do you see the labour market? Um, do you see unemployment is going to remain steady? Do you think there are any fears that it might rise? Um, surely different industries are, of course, faring better than others. But uh, what's your take on the, the picture of the labour market unemployment? Well, first of all, you could say that a high number of vacancies is a nice problem to have. I mean, it's much better to have you know, employers looking for, for workers than not. And it's a reflection of strong demand for, for people in, the, in employment. So that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Obviously, um, it would be better if those posts could be filled quickly. But markets have ways of sorting these things out. And so... You know, where there are particular shortages in particular industries, then the solution is for wages in those industries to rise relatively quickly compared to, to wages elsewhere. So um, I think that's something that the, the markets can, can fix over time. It's not necessarily something that the government needs to, to wade in and, uh, and get involved in. Um, if anything, the role of the government should be limited to removing um, artificial restrictions on uh, on people's ability to, to take jobs. And a, a good example of that is the, is the HGV driver shortage last year, which was but partly a, a, a consequence of, of Brexit and sort of slowly to move on, on visas. Um, but it's also because in order to, to be an HGV driver, you've got to have a licence from the government. The government wasn't handing out any licences because it wasn't testing any pe people because of COVID. So um, there are various ways that the government can help to make it easier for people to qualify and to... Uh, to fill these roles. So um, I, I would be reasonably optimistic that the labour market will remain strong and that people will see you know, higher wages as a, as a result of increased demand for, for labour. Um, the missing piece of the, the, the puzzle, though, is, is, of course, productivity. And um, this is where I, I've got a sort of longer term concern, which I suspect I, I share with, with Chris, is that in the long run, if you want a strong economy uh, and rising real wages, you need productivity to recover. And we have had a long period of relatively low productivity 
in the UK economy. Um, some people say that's because the government has not been doing enough. The government itself has been underinvesting. I think it's the opposite problem. I think the government has been intervening too much, particularly in you know, relatively high productivity sectors like energy and uh, financial services. So the, there does need to be a fix to the productivity problem, and that, that's only the only way to get real wages up in the long term. Uh, but over the course of this year, I think that you know, workers will have more bargaining power, as Chris said earlier, that will mean, you know, higher wages, also more job security, which is important, because many households, not all, of course, but many households did actually build up quite substantial savings during the pandemic, that they can now use to maintain their living standards, uh, during what is only hopefully a temporary squeeze on real incomes because of higher inflation. So um, we might be able to sort of weather, weather this sort of temporary spike in inflation and not see spending fall, because people are still happy to dip into their savings. And if they're more confident about their job security and less worried about COVID, uh, I think consumer spending might remain firm this year, despite a squeeze on real incomes. So it looks like the labour market will remain hopefully strong, but we have that uh, issue with productivity, which uh, may not uh, improve in just one year. Lastly, let's have a look at the nanny state, Chris. So the UK slipped last year from from fourth place to 11th place in the nanny state index which is a good thing um but it didn't necessarily mean that we liberalized anything it was more that uh, other european countries chose to have uh, a lot more nannying and lifestyle interventions than perhaps uh, than perhaps we did um we've seen a lot of focus on people's diets this year do you think the public health lobby and the government will be moving towards more bans on smoking vaping uh, alcohol hikes, tax hikes, and so on. What do you reckon? Well, probably. They always do. I mean, it doesn't matter which governments are charged. This, this nanny state bandwagon just goes on and on. Um, I mean, uh, looking forward to the next 12 months, um, there is going to be a tobacco control plan for England published at some point. I really have no idea what's going to be in there. It seems to me that the anti-smoking lobby has just uh, exhausted every possibility now. There is talk about putting individual warnings on cigarettes, on the actual cigarette itself. You know, This is the extent to which they're scraping the barrel. But there's bound to be something in there, uh, and it's probably not going to be particularly liberal. Vaping, hopefully, will be okay. Public Health England's a great champion of vaping for all for all its faults. It was, it was pretty sound on that. It's now been replaced by the Office for... I keep forgetting what it's called. Office for Health Promotion and Disparities, um, which seems to be largely the same personnel. So hopefully they will continue to stand firm um, being broadly supportive of vaping. It's much needed because the, the, the public understanding of the relative risks of vaping and smoking is going back, even in England, is going back even, even more uh, in other countries around the world. The World Health Organization is really gunning for vaping. Mike Bloomberg um, is spending hundreds of millions of pounds campaigning against vaping. So vapors are under a lot of pressure. England is kind of the exemplar, really, of, of how to deal with vaping, which is to say you just don't over-regulate it and, um, and you tell people the truth about how much, uh, how much less hazard it is than smoking. Um, in addition to those two, alcohol, I haven't heard much in the, in the way of, uh, kind of rumours that government in Westminster, at least, is going to do anything. Uh, minimum pricing has just come in this week in Ireland. It's already in, in Wales and in Scotland. There's a lot of pressure from the Irish for Northern Ireland to go the same route as you, you can imagine why because people are already flocking over the, the borders to buy uh, cheap diesel and, and cigarettes and alcohol without minimum pricing uh, exacerbating the price difference um and the final thing would be um well apart from uh, food i'll come to in a second is, is gambling there's just been a gambling review we've had the clamp down on fixed odds betting terminals already that kind of fired the starting gun for a renewed crusade against all forms of gambling online gambling is under a lot of pressure. Gambling advertising is is under threat. Gambling sponsorship, which is something I'm particularly passionate about as a snooker fan, because most of the tournaments are sponsored by gambling companies. That is is also under under pressure. So there needs to be a bit of a fight back against that. And the food stuff that you've already mentioned, that's basically there. I mean, it's been. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's finally passed through the House of Commons and, and House of Lords, but it will be very soon. And that includes. Um, a kind of unprecedented, I mean, like globally unprecedented controls over the food supply in peacetime, at least in terms of telling shopkeepers where they can position different types of food, banning the advertising of so-called junk food, which actually includes things like cheese and bacon and ham and butter and all sorts of things that aren't really junk food. Um, that's going to be banned completely on the internet, 24 hours a day by any company, which is insane. And, and on TV before 9pm and there's other stuff I won't go into. There's a whole 
smorgasbord of anti anti food, so called anti obesity policies, which uh, you know uh, Theresa May didn't seem very keen on, but Boris Johnson is. So I mean, you know, who who do you have to have as prime minister to say no to this kind of stuff? So uh, even if it's a disastrous year for the economy, you're still definitely going to have a job. That sounds like you're going to be very busy. Huh. Busy this year, mm. indeed. Um, lastly, can we have some predictions or perhaps what would you like to see from the government? If you had one, uh, just one policy or something that you don't want them to do, it could be something they need to do or not do, whatever the case may be, um, in order to boost ep economic growth or to restore freedom in this country or to make society better in terms of nanny state interventions, what would your one wish be or one proposal be for the government? Julian, do you have one to restore economic growth to where it should well, be? I, I, I've probably got about 100, actually. <laughs> um, I, I think I mean, my 100 will all have the same theme, which is that to, to recognise that it was probably necessary for the government to, to intervene massively in the economy uh, during the pandemic. But the circumstances in which it did so were, were exceptional, you know, the, a public health crisis and, and an environment where the private sector was either unable or, or willing to spend. So the state needed to, to step in. And even me as a liberal free market economist recognised the, the need for that. Um, but now is the time to be you know, rolling back the, the state again and to you know, recognising that the circumstances that justified the intervention over the last year or so were exceptional. Um, and therefore, to have a relentless focus on um, you know, lowering taxes, also lowering spending, as, as Chris was saying, you know, deregulating the economy, um, getting back to you know, where, much closer to where I'd like to be, which is you know, allowing the private sector to thrive, it's the private sector that ultimately creates real jobs and, and so on and so on, uh, and not to assume that more government intervention is the, is the answer to, to everything. So what I'd like to see is a sort of shift in that mindset. Um, I have to say that that that's very hard to achieve. I mean, people you know have got used to the idea that the government is 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 a solution to, to everything. Um, a lot of the ideas that you know that the, the adulation for the NHS, the assumption that privatization is responsible for higher energy prices, all sorts of uh, problems like that 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 need to be overcome. So the IEA is going to have to be you know very, very busy over the next few years to ensure that the, the state is rolled back. And I think it's going to be quite an uphill battle. Yeah, I agree. Chris, what do you want to see? Well, I don't know if it counts as one policy, but I, what I would like to see is the government taking the opportunity of post-Brexit deregulation seriously. And if the government can't think of any particular things to do other than abolishing tampon taxes, then it, I think it needs to have a national conversation and go around the, the country soliciting ideas, primarily from small businesses rather than large businesses. Because large businesses often quite like these regulations. They, they put up a you know, the barrier of entry mm -hmm. to small the competitors. But go, go, I mean, even just go through the newspapers the last 30 years and see about, read about all the, the European directors that everybody was complaining about. See if those complaints were legitimate. If they were, get rid of the regulation. Speak to small businesses. Say, you know, what particular regulations are tying your hands? It'll be something really obscure in many cases. Because that's the thing about European regulation. It was petty. And, but all this stuff combined added, you know, added to this kind of business stifling atmosphere so let's find stuff to repeal um get out there speak to people who are actually dealing with this stuff find out what can be made what, what can happen to make their life easier and while you're at it yeah let's discuss some british regulation as well it didn't all come from brussels but yeah we need serious deregulation uh, and particularly i would say also finally um, in, in the labor market i think the government should be looking uh, an aim of policy i think should be to make it totally unnecessary for any small or medium-sized enterprise to have a human resources department at all. It shouldn't be necessary. It should be pretty obvious what the law is, we're not having these people in there should be sifting through endless amounts of, uh, of uh, legislation. And probably the same could be said for accountants as well. Things need to be simplified. And uh, we need to get back to you know, common sense and, and trusting people to, to run their businesses as they see fit. Couldn't agree more. And that's exactly what Victoria, our head of regulatory affairs, was saying. There's no excuse not to have a systematic review of all the EU regulation that we've inherited and scrap what we don't need or scrap what's useless and pointless. All the reasons why many of us voted Brexit to begin with. Um, so we want to get the state out of the way 
and rethink regulation. And I'd like this year to be the year we bid farewell to COVID restrictions, isolation rules, travel restrictions, and so on. But we can only hope. Thank you for joining me. I hope 2022 is a better year than the past one. Although, personally, I'm sure we've all had uh, some highlights of 2021. Let's hope 2022 will be better um, for the economy anyway. Uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you.